Melody. And a lighting going on. Perfect, thank you. Good morning, good morning pilgrims. And welcome to the service of worship today. It's a pleasure to see you and to have you part of our worshiping congregation. In my opinion, you are the remnant faithful compared to last week. If you came this week, you're pilgrims through and through. We're really glad that you're here with us today for our service of worship. Uh, we have a couple of announcements. Carolyn. <clears throat> Is it? Oh, it's on. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Sunquist. Um, uh, the uh, next women's group meeting is this coming Thursday at one o'clock in the church parlor. That's a change from the normal 1.30 meeting time. The speaker is Chrissy Bernard. Um, and Chrissy is an expert in providing support and advocacy for people living with mental illness. Both uh, Carla and Cynthia have met Chrissy and, and got her lined up, and they've been very impressed by her work. There is a, a lot more about Chrissy in your bulletin this morning. Hope you can come. Thank you. She really is a remarkable person, so I hope you can come. Jean. Jean Jacobson. <laughs> uh, the Pilgrim Book Group is going to meet tomorrow at 3 on a Zoom, and uh, we're reading The Girl with the Louding Voice, and uh, looking forward to hearing what Jane says, because she's actually finished it. <laughs> Go Jane. Thank you. Jessica. Good morning, everybody. Jessica Schroeder. I, um, aside from playing the organ here, I direct the orchestra at Scholastica, and today we have a performance of J.S. Bach's St. John Passion. And I just wanted to invite you all to it in case you're available today at 3 p.m. Um, today marks the 300th anniversary of the premiere of this work in Leipzig, and we've combined schools. So it's the orchestra and choir from CSS and the choir and orchestra from UWS, and we have come together to present this masterwork. So it's 3 p.m. today at Pilgrim Lutheran over in Superior, and I hope some of you can make it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I think those are all of our announcements, and so if you would now take a few moments to stand and greet one another with the signs and the words of peace. Would you please now remain standing and join me in our responsive call to worship. Beloved, we are an Easter people. Beloved, we live in constant hope. Beloved, we have nothing to fear. Let us pray. O oh God, as we celebrate your presence in all life, we know many of your children live in fear. We ask for your reassurance that the story of our faith, which gives us hope and strength, be a light to all we meet. Amen.
Please be seated. <clears throat> A reading from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, 32 through 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and bought, brought the proceeds of what they had sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Second reading is from the book of Jeremiah, 31, 16 through 17a. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, says the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future. I'd like to invite the kids to come on up. Hi, Ivy. It's you and me. I'm going to sit here with you. So, uh, look at, we're on the big screen right there. Um, so, what Warren just read, there was this part where he was talking about some of um, Jesus' friends, and it said that everything they owned, they had in common. Do you know what that means? It means they shared everything. Everything. I was wondering if you wanted to share that stuffy with me. Oh, that's a big deal. Ivy loves her stuffies. Ivy, are there other things that you have ever shared with, with people, with friends, with family, maybe a perfect stranger? You share your toys, too? Yeah. Well, hello. Hi. Hi. Oh, everybody has a stuffy today. But I don't have one. I... Wow. Well, there we go. This is kind of what Jesus was hoping for. If Ivy, Sylvia... Lark, when, when Jesus said, share, share your things, I think this is what Jesus meant. If you see somebody that doesn't have something and they need it, share it. And then nobody is needing anything. What other things do people need that we could share? don't have a color. Markers. Yep. Hey, Sylvia, what other things could we share? Food. Food. Pilgrim, pilgrim people are really good at sharing food, especially peanut butter. We're real good at sharing peanut butter. My mama shared food when I was little. She did? To a homeless person. Oh, that's really good, too. A banana. Oh, I love bananas. Well, you know what? There's other things we can share that aren't things we can actually touch. What are those things? <laughs> that again? Germs. We can share germs. <laughs> and you know what? Kindness. Kindness. Yes. Yes, kindness, germs, all those things we can share. I have my phone here. And... W can you see what's happening? What's happening? What do you see? Anything? People. 
people and they're playing a game. Do you know what they're playing? Basketball. And this is, my niece is playing basketball in Stevens Point, Wisconsin right now. And her dad, my brother-in-law, shares the game with people who can't be there on Facebook. He's, record, he's sh re videoing right now so I can watch the game even though I'm not there. Maybe I shouldn't be watching it in church, but I can't help it. I just, I just got to see what's going on. It's the fourth quarter, and they're playing the, not the championship round, but they're playing the really good team right now. So we can share food, we can share kindness, we can share germs, we can share stuffies and markers, just like Jesus' disciples shared too. Let's pray, and we'll go talk a little bit more about sharing, especially when we don't want to share, because that happens sometimes too. Let's pray. God, thank you that we can share. Thank you that we can make this world more of what you want by sharing. Sharing the things that we have, sharing our talents, sharing kindness, sharing our stuff. Please help us be uber super good sharers. In your name, amen.
Oh, Jane, <laughs> thank you so much. It's stunning. When a new minister arrives in her new church, she hears stories about previous ministers. I've made my peace with this practice, knowing that stories about me have been told in every church I've served, and only a few of them are flattering. Sometimes the stories about prior ministers are kind of incredible. For example, one of my predecessors in a former church used to introduce the time of taking up the offering in worship with these words, give what you can, take what you need. Let that think, sink in a little bit. Of course, it was the 1960s, and he was trying to be hip, apparently. But to my knowledge, as far as anyone could tell anyway, nobody ever took money out of the plate as it passed them by. Another predecessor, this one way back in the late 1800s, told his congregation they could not leave worship until there was sufficient cash in the offering plate to retire a debt the church had incurred. The organist played hymn after hymn until finally one matron rose, walked up to the pulpit and announced that if the minister would accompany her to the bank the next morning, she would give him the money needed. And she apparently said, now let these poor people go home. I'm pretty traditional when it comes to pledge campaign time. I wouldn't dare try either of those methods. But neither would I follow the way described in the book of Acts that Warren just read a moment ago. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them for as many as owned lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. And they laid that at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Although it's hard to date the writing of the book of Acts precisely, it was probably authored by Luke, which would put it sometime after the year 70, when life was still very, very dangerous for the converts to Jesus as the Messiah. Paul was traveling around by this time, preaching and forming little communities of believers. But by and large, followers of Jesus and then Paul were likely pretty impoverished living in genuine danger under the rule of Rome and the outrage of fellow Jews who were antagonistic to the reinterpretation of Judaism taught and modeled by Jesus. So it made some sense for them to share everything that they had with one another, if only to survive. No one was in need for anyone who had any wealth at all sold what he owned and gave it to the disciples, whereupon it was distributed to those who had need. Sounds kind of idyllic, doesn't it? Until you realize that those small communities of Jesus' followers, well, they were in danger for their very lives. They had to hide every time they gathered together to pray. They couldn't talk openly about Jesus, and certainly not about the governance that Rome held over them. So the phrase, as any had need, isn't likely to work as an effective stewardship or pledge theme in 2024 at Pilgrim Church. Very few of us live 
with genuine financial need. And we're not required to hide our worship. And our government isn't hunting us down except for our taxes. Some 700 years before Acts was written, when the prophet Jeremiah wrote to his people, the Jews were living in exile, which meant they were a minority people living in a foreign majority culture. They were cut off from home, strangers in Babylon, having been conquered by the Babylonian army. They weren't isolated in an internment camp. They weren't hiding exactly. They weren't in a refugee compound, but they knew that wherever they went, the majority Babylonian citizens knew who they were and that they had been captured and that they were strangers. Their memories of home were deep and strong. The rituals of a religion they were no longer allowed to practice. The greetings they gave one another in the mornings no longer tolerated. Fears for those from whom they were forcefully separated constant in their minds. Some of them tried to assimilate, pretend they were glad to be in this new place not draw any attention to themselves, slide below the radar, act and dress and talk like the people they were walking among. Some of them fought viciously and constantly and were viciously and constantly jailed or even executed. They feared God had abandoned them. They were isolated within a culture they hated disproportionately arrested, disproportionately despised, disproportionately disparaged and ridiculed. They were on their own, feeling as if God was no longer with them. Jeremiah told them, there is hope for your future. We aren't living under the threat of exile. By and large, our government isn't our enemy, I hope. So why would I have pushed for this to be our stewardship pledge campaign theme, along with the beautiful picture depicted on your bulletin taken by Colin Williamson, that green branch growing out of dark rock, hope for your future. Here's what I believe to be true. This is why I ask you to pledge generously to Pilgrim Church. It is my own faith statement so to speak. There is a place for a strong, loving, courageous, intellectually honest, occasionally misguided, but always trying to do better community of faithful people in the world. And to be specific in northern Minnesota and to be more specific in Duluth. There is a need for realistic, challenging, respectful, culturally knowledgeable Christianity in the world, in northern Minnesota, and in Duluth. There is a yearning for the emotional discovery and inspiration that comes from the religious arts, stained glass windows, choral and instrumental music, color and light and poetry. There is a persistent, stubborn, determined awareness that the world isn't as it should be. 
that too many people live beneath the burden of distrust, dishonesty, discrimination, and disease, and that the world could be better, that it can be better, and that it must be better, and that it is up to us to try to make it better. There is an awareness that along with all the joy of being human, with its humor and affection and awe, there is the inescapable knowledge that we live in a constant state of grief and that living in community with fellow believers diminishes grief's stranglehold on our hearts and minds. There is a time for baby chicks in worship and the scent of lilies and familiar faces and the energy of children and the reticence of youth and the stories and the table that reminds us of pain and loss and commitment and mystery in little bits of bread and thimbles full of grape juice. All of this that's who we are. That's why we are. All of this and so much more is what I find in Jeremiah's promise that in God, in the body of Christ, in the community of faith, here in Pilgrim Church, there is hope for the future. Your future, our future. And it is that very hope that as any have need of it, they receive. Amen. Two verses. <laughs> Please be seated. I invite you now to give generously of your own gifts for the work of this church as it carries out its mission here and around the world. Our ushers will now receive the morning offering.
O God, most generous and kind, we thank you for the hope our faith brings to us. May we be generous in turn for the sake of your people here and everywhere. We dedicate these gifts and our lives to your service. Amen. Please be seated. On Communion Sundays, we tend not to have a full pastoral prayer, instead replacing it with the prayers surrounding the communion meal. Today, especially, there are several people in our midst of our congregation whose needs are pretty deep right now, and so I want to offer some prayerful acknowledgement of some of our dear members and friends. Julie Johnson's brother-in-law was in an accident, has broken the skull bone, and is in a coma. And we pray for him, for Julie, and for those who are watching over him. Alice and Sam Marks are facing some new health challenges, and we want to be with them as they make decisions to come Alice was scheduled for a surgery tomorrow that has been postponed because of other issues and needs in Sam's life. A number of our members and friends are walking with loved ones who are grieving or who are with those who are awaiting death. We hold them also in our hearts and in our minds as we enter into our Liturgy of Communion, keep close to your own hearts and awareness that this table is a table as much of grief as it is of hope. Now let us join together in the liturgy of our communion meal. Come, friends, to this table of love, new life, memory, and hope. Come as the first disciples came with hearts hungry to understand our Savior. Come to be nourished by the love of God. Come to receive the forgiveness of Christ. Come to dedicate yourselves to faithful discipleship. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless this bread and cup and all of us with the outpouring of your spirit. Through this simple food, form us into the living body of Christ, your servant people, that we too may be nourishment for a world starved for gracious kindness, for giving love and hopeful dignity for all. Help us as we devote ourselves to discipleship to our Savior Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup, and when he had given the blessing, he poured and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is the new covenant of my blood. I shall not drink of this again until I drink it new with you in God's reign. Ministering to you in his name, we give you this bread and this cup. 
You're invited to come forward to receive the bread and then the cup and then to put your empty cups in the trays. May God be with us all and with those we love as we receive this holy meal.
Most loving God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God go above you to protect you, beneath you to uphold you, beside you to teach you, before you to guide you, behind you to forgive you. Wherever you go, may God go with you. Amen.